This episode brings us toward the middle of the Cretaceous period, 120 to 100 million years ago. And there were a lot of birds already. A couple episodes ago, we looked at the origin of birds in the Jurassic, and now we'll look at how they've diversified since then. Rahone avis probably shouldn't be considered a true bird. It was a flying theropod, like Archaeopteryx, but it had oversized sickle talons revealing a closer relationship with velociraptors. Like Confucius Ornus and Archaeopteryx, it was barely able to fly, being weak on both the upstroke and the powerful downstroke that requires a deeper keeled sternum for larger pectoral muscles. But these were among the most primitive beginnings of the aviary. And now we have a few new Confucius ornithiforms and a few more varieties of birds. Enantiorniths were among the most common, with about 80 species known so far. Nearly all of them have claws in their wings and teeth in their beaks, and, but they look like modern birds otherwise, at least externally. Among the more interesting of these is a pair of seabirds showing convergent evolution. For example, Ichthyornis is like a Cretaceous seagull. Uh, we don't know if it could float or swim like a modern gull, but it was a strong flyer and evidently did the same job as a seagull otherwise, except that there's no direct lineage from this to that. Ichthyornis only looks like a seagull until you get up close enough to see its teeth, which of course modern gulls don't have. Another example of convergent evolution went the other way. Hesperornis is the first bird we know of to abandon flight, becoming something like a Cretaceous penguin, except that they weren't cute like penguins. They were almost as big as people, and they had teeth like crocodiles. So wandering into a colony of these flightless freaks wouldn't be at all like communing with our friendly penguins of today. All these different types of birds were wiped out at the end of the Cretaceous with no descendants beyond that. So it looks like only one branch of the bird family tree made it through that extinction and then flowered into all the new and different varieties of birds we have today. Ornithuromorphs, like Yanornis, are considered stem birds, meaning the origin of birds as we know them, and not just flying velociraptors. Among these stem birds, Yornis are closer to modern birds, but they still have belly ribs and a few other dinosaur traits that modern birds don't have anymore. And this makes them intermediate transitions, just like practically everything else we've talked about so far. But at this point, I want to mention a creationist argument that doesn't consider genuine intermediates to be transitional species. Rather than looking at any of the many examples we actually have, Kurt Cameron famously demanded to see a crocoduck, being two existing species blended into a third that he said should also still exist. All through the fossil record and life, we don't find one of these, a crocoduck. There's just nothing like it. As strange as this may sound, we actually do have some of these on fossil record. Cameron doesn't look in the fossil record because he thinks that the world was created only 6,000 years ago. So the Turkish temple of Gobleki Tepe must be almost twice as old as the universe around it. But if he would look into the fossil record, he would see that we actually do have a few different crocoducks to show him. Now, the actual ancestor of both crocodiles and ducks would really be a basal archosaur like Euparcaria in the early Triassic, from which crocodilomorphs developed on one side, leading to crocodilians, of course, while the other side led to ornithodirons, to dinosaurs, to birds, to ducks. But Cameron is asking for a crocodile duck, and we actually have something like that, too. At first, we have things like a Trachodon and the huge Anatotitan, also known as a duck dinosaur. But that's a duck and a dinosaur, although a duck is a dinosaur. But then we have another dinosaur called Spinosaurus, an enormous predator that was famously depicted in Jurassic Park 3. But that's one of many that wasn't rendered accurately. It was actually quadrupedal, and what the movie got right, which was just a lucky guess on their part, was that it liked water. It turns out, Spinosaurus is the only known aquatic dinosaur, and it was described by a paleontologist as a chimera, half duck, half crocodile. We don't have anything alive that looks like this today. There's just nothing like it. But there's still one more that's an even better match. The crocoduck has the head of a crocodilian on the body of a duck, but Anatosuchus, whose name means duck crocodile, is the counterpart of that, with the head of a duck on the body of a crocodilomorph. It's a duckodile. I mention this absurd aside only because Anatosuchus and Spinosaurus were both alive at this point in the early mid-Cretaceous where we are in the series so far. In most of these episodes, we've had only one or two extant lineages out of several that died out between then and now, and the one surviving lineage to which we belong was evident only from fossils. 
But now that we're into placental eutherians, we have a collection of living descendants on both sides of each of the next few forks in this tree. That means we have extant DNA from each of these groups that we can compare and contrast, not just with marsupials and monotremes, but also within our one clade to show where these shared consistencies diverge and verify what these relationships actually are beyond what we could determine from fossils alone. So now we can build our tree genetically as well, such that modern cladistic phylogenetics is a twin-nested hierarchy, where molecular data can provide an objective confirmation or correction of previous analyses based on morphology, physiology, and embryology. It's essentially the same thing as a genetic paternity test or using DNA to identify your ethnic heritage. Though we're obviously talking about going much, much deeper, the principle is still the same. For example, 3,000 genomes or somewhere thereabouts of different organisms were fed into a computer for comparison without any human desires or biases, and it automatically generated this cladogram. It's an almost unwieldy depiction for this volume of data in a single illustration, but at the same time, it's actually sparse with only 3,000 genomes out of the million or so needed to be considered complete. And importantly, it matches what we already knew from earlier methods of classification. And that's not all. To a degree, we can even use comparative genomic sequences to date the divergence of any lineages we have genetic samples for. The molecular clock is typically Bayesian interpretations of maximum probability and parsimony of averaged mutation rates. We're only talking about significant mutations, and we know the rate is not always constant, so it's not as reliably accurate as absolute dates provided by radioisotopes. But in this case, most of the fossils found from parent and daughter clades are dated together to immediately after the KT extinction event. Calamities tend to have the effect of piling a lot of dead bodies together, where the proper chronological sequence of fossils may have been scant under normal living conditions, especially since mammals in the age of dinosaurs were more often swallowed whole than fossilized. But every genomic sequence analysis implies that these first placental eutherian divisions must have occurred earlier in their implied sequence during the Cretaceous period when dinosaurs were still around. This is where placentals divided into two groups, both of which still exist, Boreutheria and Atlantogenata. The latter group represents Xenarthrans and Afrotherians, or African mammals, those originating in Africa. And these include aardvarks, hyrax, manatees, elephants, and elephant shrews. The other group, Xenarthrans, are the mostly toothless mammals, sloths, anteaters, and armadillos that originated in the Americas after the continental split. So the Atlantic now divides these genetic lines, hence the name Atlanta genata. The other fork in this road, Boreo eutheria, represents the everything else category of all other mammals you can think of that we haven't already mentioned. I read three different molecular studies of this division with a different number of genomes for different species used in each one. So there's some variance, of course, especially with slightly different mutation rates. The margin of error is broad enough that this divergence could have happened as recently as 100 million years ago, but that begins to conflict with other test results. So as far as I can tell, all three tests considered, the greatest parsimony of average mutation rates puts this division at 119,780,000 years ago. That's evidently when the last common ancestor of elephants and people lived. I wonder what sort of transition Kirk Cameron would want to see for that. Of course, the animal we're really talking about looked more like an elephant shrew than an actual elephant. And most of the synapomorphies for each of the featured clades in this series have actually been autapomorphies, distinct traits unique to that group, but not this time. Some educational sources say there are no diagnostic characteristics for Boreutheria, and that is technically correct. But other sources commonly cite the physical trait of having an external scrotum, and that's correct too, because it's a common and obvious trait in Arclade, but not in the sister group. Neither elephants nor armadillos have visible testes, but most marsupials do, and their scrota are similar to ours. So rather than another convergence, testes must have dropped well before this division in our common ancestor among basal therians, leading to both marsupials and placentals. So what happened to our sister group, Atlanta genata? Geneticists have determined that suspending testicles in a scrotum is actually an ancestral trait even in Afrotherians, but that their testicles don't drop anymore because of a genetic defect in their development, one that was inherited by both daughter branches of that clade. 
So their atapomorphy is that they're so poorly designed that all their descendants inherited the same defective genes. For pretty much any species, you'll typically find on the order of a hundred or more broken genes that existed back then and were subsequently lost. These are called molecular fossils, just one more line of evidence or facts that only make sense within the context of evolutionary theory. And regardless how you feel about evolution, you understand that this leaves only one group of placental eutherians that have a scrotum. If you followed this series, I'm sure you'll see this coming. You realize that makes you Boreutherian. The question is, do you have the balls to admit it? <laughs>